As I said before, welcome to this special evening being hosted by the Vancouver Entrepreneurs Group. And um, what I'd like to do is to welcome the founder and uh, serial entrepreneur of this group who started the, this meetup group, uh, Mr. Dan Locke. Maybe we get a big round of applause for Mr. Dan Locke. All right, Dan. Let me get up here. My way through. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is my mic on? Yes. Hearing me okay? Yes. Let me ask you a question. Thank you. Thank you. By a show of hands, how many of you are here because you feel stuck in your business and you're looking for a way to break free and make more money? Put that way up and say yes. yes. How many of you are here because maybe you're in a oh, growing business but you want to grow faster? Put that way up and say yes. yes. How many of you already have a good business but you want to make it freaking great? Say yes. yes. How many of you here just as a friend or as a colleague uh, to support me or Ju Kim. How many did that? Thank you, thank you. Now let's start the evening by giving a high five to three people that you don't know. Go for it. Hi, high five, buddy. Yes. Hi. I don't need a phone. Yes. Good. Okay, now I want to start off, before we get started, I want to take a moment and thank uh, a few key people because without them, we wouldn't have an event. So the very first person I want to thank is my co-organizer, uh, Roger Killen. Where, Roger, where are you? Roger. Yes. Roger! Yeah, round of applause. So Roger and I, we came up with the idea of the concept of this event and, and that's how you're here. And the second group of people I want to thank is my promotional partners. Uh, Jonathan Chow in the back, Francis, uh, Ricky Shadi, Matt Asafan, uh, Jay, and so many others and his uh, group of bloggers. So please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Now, also how many of you recognize there's a lot going on behind the scenes coding, coding one of these events? Yeah, so of course I want to thank my team for making this happen. So Joe, Mike, Jenny, Justin, uh, Hassan, Jeremy, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the last person that I want to thank is also the most important person is you. I want to thank you for being here because 100% of the, my personal portion of the profits from the ticket sales will be donated to BC Insurance Hospital. So thank you. So just for you, by you being here, you are, you are helping the kids at the hospital. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, how many of you have been to other uh, workshops and seminars before? Okay, great. Now, when I first came up with the idea for this event, I thought to myself, how could I come up with something a little bit different? How can I come up with something a little bit more unique? Because unfortunately, nowadays, I used to go to a lot of workshops, but now not so much. Because I just feel like yeah, most of the speakers out there nowadays, they are what I call, they're talkers. They're, they're not doers. How many of you can relate what I'm saying? Okay, they talk a good game, but they're not someone who's been there and, and done that. So I thought to myself, how can I bring you someone that is a high performance individual that is a little bit different, that is not just a talker, but a doer. Not just someone who is a good entrepreneur, not even a great entrepreneur, but an outstanding entrepreneur. Someone who's not just doing a million dollar deal or $10 million deal, even a $100 million deal. In this case, it's a $360 million deal. Uh, and someone like that, because uh, for those of you who are familiar with me and, and, and my work and who know me personally, uh, what's my mission? Share it out loud. What's my mission? In not how long? Five years. So to help, my mission is to help 100,000 entrepreneurs in the next five years. And I believe I can do this in three ways. How many ways? Three, three ways. The first way is through my meetup group, which is Vancouver Entrepreneurs Group that I've set up, that we meet every second Wednesday at Vancouver Club, where we, we help each other, we challenge each other, we, we learn from each other, where I'm usually a facilitator. In fact, how many of you uh, are regular attendees for Vancouver Entrepreneurs Group? Put that way, I'm make a sound. Yeah, that's good, that's good. It's almost one-fifth of the room. And the second way is through the power of social media, where I take the, the powerful lessons from the group, then I post it on the internet, on YouTube, 
And in fact, if you go to YouTube right now, if you type in Vancouver Entrepreneurs Group or you type in my name, Dan Locke, you find hundreds of videos that I've uploaded on various topics. They're entrepreneurs from anywhere in the world that they can get access to their information just at their fingertips on sales, marketing, leadership, management, uh, different types of topics. And my goal is for in the next few years, I want to have over a thousand of these videos online. And I would categorize them in a different play playlist. So when anyone in the world, any entrepreneur who needs help, they can just go there and find a solution that they need. Sound good? And the third way is something like this, an event like this, Shoulder of Titans, where I invite the, the most powerful, the most successful, the most influential speakers, uh, business leaders, titans that I know, and to, to get up, so you can get up close and ask the questions that you want to ask, that you can learn from them. Because who you spend time with is who you become. How many agree with that? So in fact, share, shout out, who you spend time with who is who you become. Okay, let me ask you a question. If you spend time with negative, nagging, energy-draining losers, what do you become? <laughs> okay. And if you spend time with positive, energetic, uplifting winners, what do you become? Okay. Hello? Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of winners in, in, in here today because as far as I'm concerned, if you're investing the time, money, and effort to be here tonight, you are a winner. Because losers, what are they doing? They're probably watching poor TV at home. False or true? Yeah, they're, so they're not here. So I want to give you, let's say, 10 minutes or so. How long? 10 minutes or so. I want you to stand up first of all. Stand up. I want you to meet some winners. How many of you have want to grab one of these sheets? You should have, have that in front of you. And if, if you don't, just put up your hand. If you don't, and my team will get you one. And on, at the top, you should see purposeful networking. Everyone, everybody has that? Yes? yes? Okay. So what I want you to do, I want to give you 10 minutes. How long? Yes. And go meet two interesting people, fascinating people, two winners in this room, and you would grab a pen and you would just fill out their name and ask them these questions. I'll give you 10 minutes. How long? Yeah. Go for it. Have a seat. How many of you have met some interesting people? Very nice, very nice. And you can continue the, the networking afterwards if it's not too late. And so let me ask you a question. How many of you want to get the most out of this evening tonight? Yes? Mm, how many of you want to get the most out of this evening tonight? Yes. That's better. So I will submit to you as you're listening to our guest speaker. I'm going to bring him, in just, bring him up in just a minute. As you're listening to Ju Kim, what I want you to do is I want you to ask yourself two questions. How many questions? Okay, the first question is how does this apply to me? What's the first question? How does this apply to me? And the second question is, how do I take direct action? What's the second question? How do I take direct action? Because nobody changes the life of business in a seminar. Nobody changes their life uh, listening to a keynote speech. What changes, what improves the quality of the business of your life is you take what you've learned and then you turn it into a, a daily discipline or routine. Does that make sense? So that's what I want you to do. So as you're listening, don't go into the mode of thinking that, because think about it, the, the biggest chokehold on a business is always the psychology. What is it? And the skill set. What is it? Of the business owner. False or true? So if because of that, as you're listening to, to Jim Kim, as you're listening to his story, don't go into the, the mentality of, well, you know what, I, 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 I can't relate to the $360 million Trump Tower project. I'm trying to figure out how to make 36 grand a month. <laughs> okay, don't go into that mentality. And don't go into the mentality of, well, I'm not in the development business. I'm not a developer. I'm not, a, a, I'm not in real estate. This doesn't apply to me. Then you've wasted your time for being here. Does that make sense? So what I want you to do is, is I want you to listen. Because in business, there are tactics and then there are principles. Tactics are industry specifics, the how to, the mechanics, the steps, the laws, and that's industry specific. I get that. And then there are principles. They are what? Principles. And principles are what? Universal. Universal applicable. The belief, the psychology, the mindset, the habits of excellence. Can that apply to any business? Yes or no? So as you're listening to Ju Kim, I want you to pay attention to what's what are the principles that I can apply in my own business? How does it apply to me and how do I take the right action? How many of you can do that? Yes? yes. Okay. When I first invited uh, Ju Kim to come and speak, I sent him an email and I said, well, 
Ju Kim, as a friend, as a good friend, you know, can you come to speak to a group of ambitious, positive, eager entrepreneurs? Could you come and do that? And he simply said, well, you know, tell me a little bit more. Tell me when you want to be there and how long you want me to be there. He didn't hum and ha or, or let me get back to you or I'll think about it. It's n none of that. None of that. He just he said, I'll, I'll be there. So let me ask you a question to a super successful person. What is more valuable, time or money? Time, time or money? Time. I promise you, I believe, believe me, Jukim is not getting paid to be here. I can't pay him enough to be here. <laughs> okay, I can give him all the admissions, it wouldn't mean that much. So he's here because he simply wants to give back to the entrepreneurial community. How many follow what I'm saying, yes? yes. So please, ladies and gentlemen, please, please give a big warm welcome to the man that you came here to see this evening, Mr. Ju Kim Tia. Thank you, buddy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All the love for you. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, so what, what I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to do two parts of this. And then, uh, this is the first time ever I'm doing this event. So I'm trying this out. Okay, stay so hanging with there with me. I'm going to do the first part where I will ask the questions that I've collected. How many of y'all feel the question, the submitted questions you want to ask? Okay, so I'll do the first part, and then the second part, then I'm going to pass around the mic, and you can ask the questions that you want to ask. Does that sound good? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Only easy okay. ones, please. Okay. And uncensored, raw, who knows what we, what's going to happen. <laughs> so, so, Juki, maybe for people who don't know you, share with us maybe a little bit about your background and your family. First of all, I just want to say thank you for everyone uh, for showing up. I'm very humble. Um, I'm very... Oh, I'll just say I'll thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm very humbled by every and honored by everyone's presence. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my background is that yes. Right? Um, so I'm originally from Malaysia. Um, I'm a second generation um, person uh, of wealth, I guess. Um, my parents basically came from a very humble. Um, background, they were very poor, they uh, worked extremely hard to, uh, to make their fortune, and um, so the business that they were uh, in at first was uh, financial services, basically um, in Malaysia they, they built up a stockbroking business, and at one point in the 90s they were the biggest uh, stockbroking firm in Malaysia. Subsequently after that, um, they started um, getting into real estate development, uh, investment, uh, so it's like construction, investment, um, development, did I say that already? And you know, um, basically anything to do with real estate. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit of background, I guess. What's <laughs> it like when you're growing up, it's, it's your, what's it like having a dad, a mom? I mean, I know your dad works very, very hard. It's not mm. always has, has, you know, spending time with you. And what, what's it like growing up in a family like that? Um, like I said, my parents were, they came from nothing. So they are very uh, tough. Um, my parents, both of them are very dominant. They actually both work together, which is um, not very common for, um, for husband and wife to work together in business, but they both do. Um, so they raised, uh, um, I guess, the most of all, uh, my, myself and, and my siblings in a very um, strict and uh, tough manner. I would say almost, and it's bad I say this, but it's true, they were very harsh to us. In, in what way? Um, it's, uh, you know, like, the, uh, and it, you know, sometimes Asian parents, the way they, they, they treat their children when they were young, it's not exactly mm. very loving. Yes. Like, <laughs> They, how, you know, how, how many of you have kids, by the way? Well, quite a few. Awesome. Like, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but like it's good and, it's good, and, good and bad. But, you know, they never, like, tell you that they love you. You know, they never, like, really hug you mm. or, like, say good things to, like, bring you up. You know, it's like if they don't say anything, it means good. That's awesome, ready. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's how it is. Um, and, and I think for me, it's also because my, both my parents worked really, really hard. I never got to see them really, okay. so I kind of grew up. I know it sounds kind of melodramatic, but I kind of grew up without parents in that sense, because mm. they were never around. And uh, but when they did see me, 
um, when they spend time with me, they were constantly being hard on me and constantly telling me what I should do or what I need to do in order to be successful in life. And when, when you're young, it's like it's very hard to swallow. It's like you don't love me, but you just tell me to do this and do that and tell me like this world is so harsh and so cold. If, I don't, if I'm not tough, it's just going to swallow me kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's the sort of background I had. Um, so I can say, yeah, my parents did not spoil me, which I'm really, really happy and glad that they, they did that because, um, you know, to, be, to do business, to be successful in business, you have to be tough, um, and it's a tough world. And I thank my parents for being really tough on me because now um, I'm tough. You know, <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can take on um, what, what the world throws at me. Uh, even from a very young, you know, from a young age, I've been conditioned that way. So would you say your mom and dad, they're your most important mentors? Yeah, without doubt. Do you have any, any other mentors in your life or just mom and dad? Mentors? Mm, no, I would say just my mom and dad because it's, my story is kind of different. I know a lot of people here, um, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I just think this is what worked for me. I know a lot of people have different mentors and they look to other people, they read a lot and they read a lot of books and they go for all these seminars and all, which is great, don't get me wrong, but for, 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 but for myself, I was never like that. Mm -hmm. For me, I, because, I've, because I was always alone, um, I always felt that um, I, you know, because when I, cause my parents didn't spend a lot of time with me, I, was, I became very rebellious. And I became rebellious maybe because they didn't show me love or attention, but in, in some ways it was good because I always wanted to be different. I always wanted to um, prove everyone else wrong. Like, mm -hmm. no, I can do it better, and I'm going to do it my own way, mm -hmm. and I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but that, in some ways, that pushed me to uh, search for the answers for myself more which I think is more important as an individual, as a business person, you need to find your own identity. You need to um, find what works for you. I think it's good to listen to what other people has to say, and other people's journey, other people's story, because they're all successful. But nothing necessarily is going to work for you because you are different. Um, and um, so, yeah, I've always, I mean, don't get me wrong, I listen to other people, and you, know, you have to learn how to listen. Um, to learn, you need to be teachable, right? Um, learn from, but at the same time, I always felt that um, I need to find what works for me more than anything else. I think, and I think that's what I think anyone who wants to be successful has to have that kind of stubborn um, conviction um, with regards to their convictions, right? Because, like, if you, you know, everything that you do in life is going to, there's going to be questions. Um, and you're going to question yourself, other people are going to question you. And if you don't believe in yourself, first of all, of who you are, as your identity as a person, then, you know, after that, you're going to have convictions about your product, your business, um, the decisions that you make. And if you don't have a stubborn 100% conviction that you are right, you know, and I believe, you know, I may not know all the details, but I know one thing for sure, and I'm 100% sure about this, and this is why. If you, if you don't have that conviction, there's no way you're going to be able to convince other people to follow you um, and, and, and buy into your, your product or buy into your company or buy into you as a leader. So I went off about a lot of things, but no, basically I think was it good? that's it. Yeah. Now, I got to say this because congratulations, I know Trump Tower is 75% sold, more than 75% sold, correct? Actually, it's 80% sold. 80% sold. 80% sold. Yeah. 80% sold. Yeah. By the way, if you don't buy one, talk to Jukim afterwards. <laughs> uh, what do you have to, because as you know, when you first announced the project of the Trump Tower, the media, I mean, in the, in the Vancouver, it's, it's, they're quite skeptical about the project. Are we ready for Trump? Are we ready for a five-star hotel? Do we need another one? Mm. A lot of negativity, doubts, skepticism, naysayers. Yeah. What do you have to say to those people now? Um, nothing negative. I, I, I want to thank them as well. Yes. You know, I want to thank the people who support me, and I also want to thank the haters. I want to thank them because they make me relevant as well, and they help fuel my desire mm -hmm. and my fire to succeed mm -hmm. and to prove them wrong. Um, I guess all I have to say is uh, the building's going to be um, topped up, 
in uh, April, um, and we are scheduled to be completed summer of 2016. We're 80% sold on a residential. Um, I've tied up with, uh, besides Trump managing the hotel, I've tied up with uh, Mod 32, which is, uh, I guess, a luxury Chinese um, in restaurant Hong yeah, in, in Hong, Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah, a very, very successful, well award-winning. Yep. I've tied up with Dre's, um, so we have the first Dre's nightclub in Vancouver, and I've also brought Equinox, which is, uh, I guess, the biggest, most successful luxury gym uh, in North America. So I'm very confident that um, I'm basically bringing the best of the world to Vancouver, and I, I know that this project's going to be a real game changer. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, when the nightclub finally opened, you guys wouldn't be interested in going to a party or anything like that, would you? <laughs> How many people want to go to a party? Okay, then I'm throwing a party. That's good, that's good. Yeah, I'm very excited. Yes. I'm very excited. On, on Ju Kim's time, okay? <laughs> I'm really excited about the club, really, because I, I don't know like, well, Walk me through, like, ping us the picture. What, what, how's it going to be different than any other nightclub? Oh, it's the, the first day club, nightclub in Vancouver. Like, when you go to Vegas, they have pool parties yes. and stuff. So we will have pool parties on certain... Um, days i guess and then you know it'll be more like a lounge doing when it's earlier during the day yes uh, and i mean the evening and then at night turns into a full-on wow. club wow yeah awesome uh, take us back i know when you were getting started you were actually worked as a researcher mm -hmm. in singapore for a period of time yes. where most people consider it's a kind of a junior kind of position what has that experience taught you number one mm -hmm. and why did you do it um, I had come to Vancouver for a while, I already had, um, I did a few small projects f with real estate and I already had, a, uh, I would say, a decent understanding of how real estate development works. And then my dad spoke to me and said, son, you have very poor knowledge of, um, of, uh, of financial matters and global markets. And I was like, you're right. Um, so he told me I had to go to Singapore to work in a bank. And he also... One thing my dad always impressed on me, which I didn't really do, was he reads a lot. Mm. And I didn't really read a lot. Mm. I was, I guess, la not lazy. I just didn't see the importance, maybe. And I just, I maybe I didn't make it a habit. Mm. So it worked out really well because I had not worked, uh, you know, from doing, you know, real estate, you can't run around and do everything. But when you work in research, you can't just sit down on a desk and just read every day. Um, you don't really do much, you just read. Um, so that was a good change for me, but it taught me um, taught me how to read more, and and I, my knowledge um, increased in global markets. That's just on the, I guess, the academic side. What was really good for me was working in a low position. It was very hum humbling, um, and I got to see how it is in the real world. In a real working uh, work environment, there is uh, a lot of politics, mm. and there's a lot of BS. You know, like there's a lot of unfairness. Does, does the manager know who you are or your background or anything like that? I think they know. Okay, they kind of know. They kind of know. Okay. Um, but it's like um, I told, I, you know, it, it, I see people that are, you know, they get promoted, they get recognized, and they don't do jack. You know, and it, they, all they do is like they know how to please PR. the boss. They know how to like please the boss. Yeah. They know how to present themselves well. They know how to speak well. Mm. And they get promoted where the people who work really hard and they do all the grunt work, but they just don't know how to, what was I going to say? Um, I think it's a better word. Kiss up. Kiss up. Kiss up. Kiss to, ass. Uh, you is. know, to, 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 to the boss or they don't know how to really market themselves. Yeah. Um, they just get stuck and, you know, they don't go anywhere. And I see it was so unfair. And what it taught me was, you know, when I become a boss again or when I lead a company, I'm going to make sure none of that nonsense happens in my company because mm. um, you know that's it's not fair and that's not a way how a company would grow and you know as you uh, I've worked with your team a little bit and I, I got to know a, a few of them uh, maybe share with us share with us your your management style how do you lead your team how do you manage your team oh I was just talking about this uh, over uh, over dinner yesterday um, I think my management style is a, is a combination of both. I think because I even I'm very Asian and traditional because I was born and raised in Asia, um, but I've also lived more than half my life um, overseas, and I was also educated overseas. So I would think that my management style is a mixture of uh, 
Asian and Western. Um, I've basically summarized, I think, um, the Asian um, style of management is basically like you have an emperor, <laughs> you have generals, <laughs> and you have subordinates. Yeah. And basically... Like a triangle. Yeah. Ba basically, it's... Um, in, uh, in, in, the, in, our, in the Chinese dynasty, if there is any disloyalty or you do something wrong, like your head gets chopped off right away. That's right. You know, there's no questions asked. Yes. Like when Saves a whole lot of time. Yeah, yeah. like, so um, <laughs> I'm not like that. Uh, you know, I don't just <laughs> cut the head off. Um, and then you have the Western style, which is a lot more, I guess, collective, where you kind of make sure everyone feels like they are part of a team and they feel a sense of belonging and ownership to uh, the company. Um, and it's a lot more back and forth and explanation. Is my mic? Okay. Is it my mic? Is it battery? Pause for a second. Let me talk to my... David, is it okay? okay? Am I good? Okay. So there's a lot of uh, explanation and then there's a lot of justification and rationale of why you do when something. Do you, need you know, explanation needs to be done for all that. And I feel that um, too much of either is bad because like, if it's too Western, it feels like everyone's like a stakeholder, like, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, you have to get consensus with regards to everything. It's just that doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. you see. Um, I try to balance the both. Um, I try to make sure my my team feels a sense of ownership and belonging to the company. They need to know that I care for them, mm. and I, w I honestly want the best for them. Yes. I want to give them a better life. Yes. You know, I want them you know, to stay with me and help build their dream and aspirations through my company. I mm. want to do that for them, I honestly do. And they see me working my butt off for them. You know? um, but at the same time, um, they need to know that I'm the boss mm. and that um, don't mess with me, mm -hmm. you know, because I will crush you if I need to. Mm -hmm. They need to know that, you know? And it's kind of... It's like a carrot and a stick. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird, you know? Mm -hmm. It's business, you know? It's like, I've learned over time... So would you say I, you're I, friends with your employees or you're... I, I certainly am, I certainly am. You know, it's like, I'm a very compassionate person, I'm a very kind yes, person, yes. but you see, I've learned in business that you can't assume that people are like that. Yes. You know, I always think, you know, I used to think that people are nice and kind and compassionate like me. Yes. See, I would never crush someone if I can, you know, like, why? You know, you want to, you know, what's the point? Yes. You know, but other people are not like that. If they can crush you, they will crush you, mm. you know? So I ha I've learned, um, I guess, maybe through the hard way as well, where you need to make sure that you are strong and you're not um, exposed or vulnerable in a situation. Um, so everyone that I do business with, everyone that works with me knows I'm like that. You know, I don't, you know, I don't say this in a disrespectful or arrogant way, but they know that I don't need them. You know, mm -hmm. they know that uh, I would love to work with them. I want them to help me yeah, uh, get to where I need to go, but they know that I'm strong, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why you work with me, you know, because I'm strong and I know what I'm doing and this ship is going to go where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. They need to know that. So... It's a, uh, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a fine balance. And I know you, <laughs> I know you work like long hours. Yeah. Uh, what, like, what's your typical daily working day like? What's it like? Because I know you exercise every day. Yeah, uh, I, I'm going to put a disclaimer here first because I don't want to encourage everyone to be like a workaholic. Um, I, I think I work long hours. I work probably about 12 hours on a weekday, um, except Friday. Um, and then on the weekend, I probably work not that long, maybe four to six hours the total weekend. Mm. Um, but I think for Canadians, Canadian standard, that's quite a lot, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Um, everyone has, you know, it's about being efficient and effective at work. But my personal opinion is, you know, there is only certain number of, of peak years or prime years in a person's life to... Um, to catch it, I guess, you know what I mean? What, what, what age you, you think that would, from what age to what age? Oh man, I just so, everyone's different, I think. I, yeah. I think some people start younger. Yeah. Um, f you know, I'm not that young anymore, but I think that th these are the years for me now to work extremely hard where I can, not say punish my body, I can take more punishment. Yes. And I feel that the, re the reality in life, I don't think there is a perfect and balanced life for, for everyone. If you wanna be, extremely successful, 
there is a sacrifice. And I feel the sacrifice comes when you're young. You know, when you're young, you need to sacrifice your time to get where you need to get. Just like you know, your mom and dad, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those people who are, I, I mean, I sound so bad, busy having quality of life, well, they're going to have quality of life. They're not going to have really great success. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people, when they're older, when they're really successful, then they're like, well, you know what? I don't need to work that hard anymore. I've yeah. got this. They because I, I've already accumulated all the knowledge, all the know-how. Yeah. I know how to manage people. I know how to reward people and motivate people to be successful. And I just do the top-line decisions. Um, then they can take it more easy and they can do more charity and all that stuff because they've already, they've already fought all those battles. Mm -hmm. They've already learned they've accumulated all that wisdom to, uh, you know, to get there. But when you're a young guy, I mean, you can only be so smart, even how smart you are, you don't have the experience. You don't have the, the, the act, you haven't gone through the actual battles. You haven't gone through, uh, you know, the business deals to, 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 to learn, you know, what to do those things. Because you can't, you can't, I always say you cannot delegate your work or you cannot guide someone else to do the work um, or make decisions when you haven't done it yourself. You know, you have to go through the fire yourself. You know, my dad always says, we cannot be a general without a fighting experience. Mm. You need to fight, you know, you need to go out there and you need to do the, the, the detailed work. The lead and, from the front. Yeah, mm. and, and that's, that's only when, you know, when I feel that when you're young, this is the time for you to do all that stuff, you know, and, and then later on in life, then you can take it easier. And I know when you, you, you are, when you work on a Trump Tower project, because in private conversation we talked about that, you, you sleep and you brief the project. That's right. All the details. Uh, I, I don't think people can, can grasp or even uh, understand or appreciate just example for restaurant wise, mm -hmm. how many locations you have traveled and, and taste different kind of yeah. food. But walk me through that. Like, oh, well, uh, in, 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 oh, my dad always said that, you know, uh, you need to be a master, uh, you know, uh, of whatever you're doing. So when I took on this project, I realized that it's not just I have to be a master and about hotels. I need to be a master of restaurants now, nightclubs, even fitness now, I guess. Um, and, and I understand the luxury markets. There's so many things to learn. So it was like a crash course to really learn. I mean, obviously, I'm not a, a real guru in a specific industry, but mm. I know um, basically in general how the industry works. Mm. And, um, I need, and, and I guess the key to being, um, you know, knowledge is one thing, is being able to see um, what's applicable to you or to your project. So like for me, um, I had a very clear vision in my head that I wanted this project to be a certain way. And I had a, I had a clear uh, understanding of what would be successful here. You know, I, I, I was very confident that you know, nightclubs, you know, if we, if we have pool parties, it's people here going to go nuts, all right? Because people here love the sun, people like pool parties, they all go to Vegas, they go to LA. Uh, we don't really have a good club here. So I could, I, you, you can identify the missing pieces, I guess, that the city wants that you're going to provide. Then mm -hmm. I think your chances of uh, success are higher. And then after that, it's just going out there and finding the proper partner or the proper person who can execute and deliver what you want to bring. And you know, and that's, it's a long process of finding the right partner, you know, striking the right deal, negotiating the right terms, um, and so forth. And you're very much into the details too, because I know- Oh, you, you have to. When you walk me through the, the showroom. Yeah. You I mean, Jukim knows the tile, the shower, head, everything. everything. Every, every, and you picked everything. Everything that goes through me. I'm like a control freak in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, I have a very clear vision of how it has to be executed yes. and it needs to be executed that way. Um, so yeah, every single detail, you know, I, I have a, you, you see, even, you know, because at the end of the day, the buck stops with me. If it's not successful, I have no one to blame but myself <laughs> because I have all the control and all the power to say, no, fix it. I want it like this, I want it like that. Yes. You know, so I have to know exactly what I must have that, like I said, that, that, that really strong conviction that I know this is going to be successful. And why? Why is it going to be successful? Because I've eat, sleep, and breathed it. I've traveled so many places. I've seen what the cl clubs are successful. Why restaurants are successful? It's designed this way. Why is the lobby successful that way? The bar is put right here. Why? So the person can see that person there. Everything, you got you to gotta really like crystallize your thoughts. And then so 
you can tell that you know don't re I don't rely on those uh, like the so-called experts to to do those things for me because they're good in executing you have to give them the direction you know mm -hmm. what I mean mm -hmm. and even I think in the showroom at a time when I went first time when I went there you were just putting up the champagne bottle yeah and you're putting on the label the staff yeah. was putting on the label yeah now I was like hey you give this is a showroom this this is this is a lot of money <laughs> just for the showroom yeah. but you said you want to create that atmosphere you want people to see what it's gonna be like in, yeah. I know it's been a lot of money just in renovation of the showroom so maybe talk to us about what's your vision because I know for people who don't know you also Holborn also owns the the Fortress BC building next yeah. to the, the Trump Tower. How many of you know where that is? The, on jo West, in West Georgia. Yeah, the Fortress BC building. You, Holborn also owns that building as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think in private you share with me that you you can see the vision turning that into a kind of a Fifth Avenue for, uh, like like New York. Yeah, like what do you have in mind? Well, um we are, we own the building next door, and it actually has retail at the bottom. Yes, and so so uh, but nobody knows because it's so it's not designed oh, yes. properly, right? Um, we didn't design it though. Don't worry. Yes. Uh, it's getting designed properly now. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna do is really because we have the the residences and the hotel and the restaurants gonna be at the bottom and yeah. the lobby bar. So oh, the hotel. Yeah, and then the yeah. Fortress BC building. So the retail of there, you know, we want to basically animate the street and make sure that. Uh, there will be continuity, you know, from people that um, walked, like, what's is that again? Is it Thurlow? Yeah. Thurlow. From Thurlow, there's a lot of traffic, yes. right? So we want to be able to suck the people from Thurlow to come down West Georgia Street. And West Georgia Street already has, it's such a celebrity, it has so much traffic, like car traffic, but foot traffic, you know, not really. So we wanted to be able to animate the street. So we want to have retail there, which... Um, oh, the luxury high-end. Yeah, luxury high-end retail. And it's going to have like high ceilings and double double frontage um, to make sure. That's where Equinox is also going to be. Mm. So uh, that's going to help animate the space. So um, whatever we do there, it's going to tie in really well with Trump Vancouver. Now I got to ask this question: Like, why Trump? Why why did you pick this brand? And yeah. there's so many hotel brands you can choose from. Yeah, I can. I got this question down. Because people How ask many me want that all the time. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, a few reasons. The first, the first of all, um, I actually, to be honest, how much time do we have? I can just go on. Okay. okay, okay. So the first one was um, I was actually hesitant to bring Trump to to Vancouver because I know uh, Vancouver in some ways is more left than right. Yes. And uh, Trump is a really right re Republican, right? Um, so uh, I could see how some people wouldn't like him. Yeah, people like him or hate him. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. it would cause, uh, you know, so at first I actually say no, I don't think this would be a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, you know, I kept, I tried, I kept an open mind, I thought about it more. Um, I wanted to, see, I wanted to, I, I actually, the, the, the process took about almost two years. You know, I was interviewing, oh yeah, it's also because I have a philosophy in, um, in my company. Uh, it's basically, is I leave no stone unturned. So like, I don't make a decision until I've explored basically everything. So, you know, um, I actually spent a lot of time, I guess, being courted or courting um, other hotel companies, you know, visited their hotels. Check out the management. Check out the management, you know, check out the terms of the, and then before I came to a decision. Um, so it took a long time. So with Trump, um, I wanted a, a brand that was, uh, had a good track record with uh, branded real estate because I'm standing real estate and, and luxury high luxury energy. real estate and there's only a few brands in the world that have been successful doing that and Trump is one of them. I wanted a brand that would uh, bring all eyes on me mm. and and, call, and bring a lot of attention like a freak train. I wanted I wanted that because um, I wanted people to not look at me but look at the project and I was I guess so confident of the product that I was like. I just need people to look at me, and once they look at the project, they know it's great. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also, um, you know, hotel because Trump is managing the hotel and branding the residences. Hotel uh, management contracts are long; they're like 20, 30 years, um, and it's like a marriage. So, one thing that kind of freaked me out and uh, ma helped me make my decision easier was uh, I was talking to one of the I guess CEOs for a big hotel company. And it's like, everything's good. You know, you talk, talk to you next week kind of thing. He never got back to me. Then I was like, what's going on, right? So I tried contacting him and I contacted another guy who was in the same company. I was like, oh, so-and-so has left us. And I'm like, left you? 
What do you mean? You know, um, then it dawned on me that a lot of these companies they're just run by executives. Correct. They and these executives, as you know, they come from one company. To yeah, they jump from one company to another. So, and the problem is with the hotel agreement, I shake a, a deal. The hand, uh, I shake, make, make a deal now. Mm -hmm. We write on paper. Ten years down, I, I sure as heck can't remember, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go look in the paper, and but at least it's, if you're the guy mm -hmm. who I shook hands with and we made the deal, we've been friends for 10, 20, 30 years yes. by then, yes. right? But if you're some new dude that I don't know who has no context of, of our relationship Correct. and just looks at the piece of paper, it's going to be scary, right? Mm. So I didn't want to put myself in that kind of position. Mm -hmm. And with Trump, um, you know, and the guy I struck the deal with was Don Jr. Mm -hmm. And he's you know, slightly older than me, but he's a young guy. So, you know, God willing, and now he's going to be around for some time. Yeah. So, so uh, he's going to be around 20, 30 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, um, so, you know, by then, I mean, we've been friends for 10, 20 years time, you know, and like, if there's an issue, I mean, I'm sure we can resolve it, right? So that was, I took comfort in that. And yeah, and also we, we did have a bond in that sense because he's also second generation guy. Mm. We both come from like very dominant fathers yeah. and, you know, and very successful and so we know what it's like to like have like all this pressure <laughs> and you know uh, mm. an expectation on you, mm. and so I know that uh, you know he's always going to do his best to make sure that uh, everything goes well. So I guess that's the bond. Now, with but they are super tough negotiators. I'm yeah, what's you. it like working with Donald Trump? It's tough. Is it like no, like no, no, I mean no, no, no. It's tough. The, the negotiating is really tough. Okay, but once the deal is signed, they're like one hundred percent got your back. Mm. Yeah. So once. A deal's done. Deal's it's, done. It's done. It's no done. back and forth. There's no more back and forth. No. Interesting. And the deal is basically because most people know that it's it's a branding licensing kind of deal. So they license the Trump brand to you, but you're the developer behind it, and you're yeah. the one that's fine. They manage the, the hotel as they well. They manage the hotel. That's right. But you 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 take care the development and the sales and marketing for the residential. That's right. Correct? We okay. do all that. Okay. Uh, well, I must say also that everything that we do in the, in the project get signed off by them though. No. So okay. like Avanka, like for example, the design, yeah. Avanka personally signs off everything. Like, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So maybe talk with us, what do you think are the qualities, maybe the top two skills that you believe it takes to be a successful entrepreneur? I think the first one is you've got to be, vis you have got to be visionary. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, I guess visionary means it's you must be able to identify, uh, I guess, a gap in the market, uh, something that's missing, something that would be successful. And you need to be able to crystallize what exactly that is. And you need to be able to bring, uh, you know, bring it, uh, I guess, package it and market it and convince people that it's the best thing ever and you must be able to sell it. So you need to be visionary in that sense. So you must have a, a mind that constantly is inquisitive uh, in terms of why why people are successful or why businesses are successful why they fail why they're successful and how is the world changing how the world changes every day does it create opportunities for um for new businesses or how does it affect a certain business um that's the first thing i think everyone here knows that because everyone here is an entrepreneur right mm -hmm. um what's one second skill second um, skill second skill mm. I don't think maybe it's a, I don't know what's the skill, but I think you um, to be successful in the long run at least it's more I guess maybe a principle. I think you need to have you got to be fair, you got to be honest, and you got to be have great integrity. Um, but at the same time, you got to be tough. So it's like you got to be tough, but you got to be all those things you mentioned because um, I think people you know once they have a bad experience, you know it's like they will just your your reputation is gone That's you it. know and like piss some guy off he'll he'll bad mouth you for the rest of his life mm. you know you make a guy happy he may be happy for a short period of time mm -hmm. you know what i mean so um i guess that's that's important you know to have integrity you know i'm also curious out of all the countries you could go to why did you pick vancouver to be kind of your home and do all the development here for the next so 10, 20 years? It kind of just dropped on me, actually. It kind of <laughs> just dropped on me. Um, well, my parents came here and we, we in, uh, they used to ski a lot in Whistler mm. and they started um, investing here. And they, you know, they s like a lot of immigrants, they saw how wonderful this country is and mm. how safe it is and how great so many things are. And 
because I came from Malaysia, and in Malaysia, it's politically it's not that safe. So they wanted to give us a second option. Mm. Um, so, and somehow we started investing more, and then somehow it's like, well, you know, someone's got to take care of it now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, what's I mean, what's after the Trump project? What's the, what's the next project? Um, I have Little Mountain mm. that I'm that I'm. Um, working on hopefully we can get to council uh, at the end of this year everything's kind of which is good. also which is also massive project. yeah it's, it's looking good it's uh it's about it's 15 acres it's probably it's about 1600 units mm. of uh, residential uh, there's there's some uh, non-market housing there's going to be some retail as well we have neighborhood house a daycare about 30,000 square feet of uh, retail and I'm missing something but it's great it's right next to the Queen Elizabeth Park um, you know we're gonna design we're gonna have a design that's really permeable basically you're gonna bring like the park to Main Street and it'll be really pedestrian friendly and bike friendly and just animated with very nice landscape and so far that's also so Trump Tower's 360 million dollar project that one's like 300 320 something um, you know, it's bet it's if I put these numbers out, it's not good for the property tax standpoint. Okay, but okay. it's a, uh, it's <laughs> a no, it's a big project. You can look up the number if you really want yes, to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Got yeah. it. Got it. Got it. No, no one from Revenue Canada or anything yeah. like that, right? Just, just, yeah. just staff check. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, we talk about what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. What about why entrepreneurs fail? Oh, I think. Um, I think they, they, they fail because I think they give, they give up, I think. And also because, you see, I think um, success doesn't come overnight. Like you, lot, most people fail a lot before they, they succeed. And you hear some stories about some people who they made it big at, when they're older, uh, you know, and they think it's like their first business venture. But like, if you actually go into the story, the dude's been trying for like 30 years, mm. you know? Um, so, I think some people give up. I think sometimes it's, you know, there's, there's so, <laughs> so many, there's so many uh, things you need to be successful. Um, you need to be in the right place at the right time. You need to be lucky. Um, all these things, right? Uh, you need to be hardworking. You need to be visionary. You need to be, you need to have charisma. You need to know the right people. All these things. And I think sometimes a lot of these things, if you're not, how should I say, reinforcing and training those attributes from young uh, and reinforcing them from young. Um, when, when you get older, it's very hard to change. Mm. And I think um, sometimes it's not so much the things that you're good in, the things that you are not good in, or the weaknesses or faults that you have that impede you from being successful. Um, my dad used to say, um, you know, you need to strip yourself of all the defects, you know, before you can, so, you know, not before you, so that you can better your chances of being successful. Mm. Like, you know, some people are very egotistic, they have a huge pride, um, they may be smart and so forth, but like, nobody wants to work with a good guy that's not humble, right? The guy, mm. guy is egotistic, it's like, I'm not going to work with him, mm. even though he's brilliant, right? Mm. Um, there's so many things, so like sometimes it's, it's the things that impede you, and you don't know it. Mm. And as you get older, um, it's tough to change. Change is very hard. So I think that's why it's so important from a young age um, to practice all the right values. And I always say that I don't care how, unless you're like a genius, okay, which I'm not. Um, I always use like sports. If, um, you know, those people, you see them, that they're successful. They've been training ever since they could walk. Every day and night, they've been training and they've been dreaming about it. Um, and what you see is only the end product. But it's, nobody can just overnight say, I'm going to be successful now. You know, it doesn't happen that way. It takes years of, 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 of you know, the right living, the right believing, so that you can have all the, 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 all the values, the work ethic, the characteristics to be successful. You know, if you've been lazy all your life, one day you think you can just get up six o'clock and o'clock every morning, it's not gonna happen. Mm. You know, you need to reinforce every day uh, all the right habits to be successful. 
and it has to become a part of you. You can't. It has to be a part of you. You know, it cannot be something that you're trying to do anymore. Not. Pr- it's part of who you are. It's part of who you are. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's the way you can. Fu- that's the only way you can function. I used to be so upset. I'm upset. I couldn't understand my father. Like, why is he so weird? You know, because for his <laughs> when you're young, you just don't get it. Right? Like, my dad would take five minutes to shower. I was like, are you even clean? You know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I mean? But like, he just, does, I don't have time. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't waste my time doing these kind of things, you know? Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's just so odd, but like... It and is, you told me, like, 10 minute lunch or something like that. Oh, it's so fast. It's so fast. And then he's just, he's constantly going, go, go, go. He's just working all the time. He's, all he does is talk about business. Mm. Um, constantly. And I feel like that, I just, you know, it's never a conversation. I feel like you just, you're living a different world. You know, but... It's because he eats, sleeps, and breathes business. It is part of him, you know? It's, it's some ways, it's almost like a defect in, its, in some it's ways. It's an you, obsession. It, yeah, you know what I mean? It's like you have to be so obsessed with it where it's part of you, you know? And it's like, I can't change the way I am because I know these are the things that are going to make me successful. Um, and I, I, you know, I used to think that was weird, but now I'm becoming like that as well. I'm becoming weird that, and like, and like that, you know, and like, which is weird, you know, because some, you know, people. The apple doesn't fall far from the trees, I yeah. guess. <laughs> like, you see, I, I, I never see like you will never, except for this event, you would never re- really catch me on a weekday yes. going out because yes. I'm busting my butt, well, right? A round of applause for that. You know, yeah. thank you. And thank you. that's you know, and like for example, I, I say this in a very humble manner, like I'm very focused. And uh, you know, one thing in business you have to be focused too because it takes a lifetime to be good. You know, you can't be, I don't think, well, maybe for me at least, you can't be good in everything. It takes a long time to master something. And when you finally master something, then maybe you can move on to something else. But if, if you put your hand into so many things, how are you going to be a master? There's only so much time in the day. Mm. So I'm very focused. You know, I focus, right now I'm focused on real estate. I just want to spend all my time doing that because I'm a type of person where, um, if I do anything, I want it to be good. Mm. I mean, I don't waste my time. Mm. Like I'm not, I always say I'm not into the cheap thrills that anyone can do. I'm searching for the higher um, prize or high that, um, that you get when you reach, you do things that people cannot achieve, you know? Like, I mean, I guess in business, if you make a lot of money or you grow a company really big, X, X amount of size, you know, if it, I don't know, if you're like a writer, you win the Nobel Prize or something, that high that you get, only a very select few in the world can ever experience that. I'm more interested in getting that than some cheap trail, like to go budgie jumping or something like that. I'm like, okay, you know, anybody could do it, right? Why am I gonna waste my time doing that? I'd rather spend those hours working towards my goal so that I can achieve the big prize then waste my time doing, being distracted, doing a bunch of stuff that don't matter. You want to do something, you're looking for a challenge. You want to do something that was ever done. Yeah, or I mean, I, and that's, I mean, I always say, uh, this goes to my YOLO talk, you know, a lot of people in this, this, these kids these days, you know, they always go YOLO, like you only live once. And I, you know, and, but the way I see it, the way they're living, it's like they live in no consequence mm-hmm. and they don't care what happens tomorrow, which is wrong. You know, for me, you only live once is because you only have one life. You, you, time passes so fast and like you can't take back all the time you've wasted. And I want to make my life count. You know, I want, when I'm at my deathbed, I come and see that, you know what? I've achieved so much. You know, I've made my life count. I've given back so much or so, or, or, you know, that's what I'm interested for. And a lot of people think they, they have a lot of time. They think they get a lot of time to waste and just do whatever they want to do and one day they'll be successful or one day they'll, they'll do something meaningful. It doesn't work like that, you know. Um, you, have to, you have to spend, you have to commit and dedicate your life, I hate to say it, towards greatness, towards success. You have to commit from a young age and you're going to make a decision that I'm going to do this and you're going to put in the hours, you're going to discipline yourself and um, you're going to do whatever it takes to be successful, you know, um, and I know it sounds cliche, but it's a decision you make, and then after that, you have to live it. It has to be a part of you every day, you know. Like I'm weird. I'm 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 the way I am because I've already set. I'm so set in my ways that I know. I believe that if I do these things, I'm gonna be successful. 
Um, so that's so why I stick to it. And I don't let anyone break it. You know what I mean? Like, um, it's weird. It, it's some, and because of that, it's lonely. You know, because not everyone's like you. Mm-hmm. You know, very few people are going to be walked that choose not because they can't. Sometimes they choose not to, to walk that path that you have chosen. You know, uh, I spend a lot of time working. Um, people outside having fun. You know, I and then I'm tired. I can't go out after that. And people don't see the sacrifice. You know, people don't see the work you put into, right? But it's those things that are going to separate you from everyone else. Right? It, it may get lonely and tough. I'm telling you, it will be. Um, then you, but you fix your eyes on the prize, right? You don't lose focus of what you want. What's more, not what you want, what's more important in life? You know what I mean? At least what's more important in life to you? To you, how do you define success? Um, oh, well. I think everyone's got their own definition of success. I think. When you, you are successful when you're able to impact people in a positive way. Because basically no one will listen to you unless you're successful. So you can't even start to impact people if people don't pay attention to you. You have to reach a certain level where you're somebody. Then people will take notice of you. And then people will want to follow you or support the things that you're doing. You know, if... Um, if well, not if one day, I mean, uh, hopefully soon, um, if I'm very successful, if I want to start any initiative, people will listen and support me. Like, I don't know, do something for charity or whatever. If you're some dude nobody cares about, you can't impact the world. You see, you're not successful. So I think success is in a way where you, you've reached a position where you can impact people's lives in a positive way. And, that's, and then you're successful. And as always, I see entrepreneurs very often, they try to save the world before they save themselves. And I always say that you, you can't give coming from a place of scarcity. You can only yeah. give coming from a place of abundance. Awesome. Totally. I mean, no disrespect to a lot of... Oh man, I'll be very, very careful when I say this. Um, there are a lot of people, I think maybe that's their calling. They work in... Um, in is it? in uh, social services, it's great. Um, and I s- really support them, God bless them. That's, uh, you know, that, that's their calling and they're really helping and giving people. And that's the right thing to do because that's their role. What I don't like is when people who, who, who choose to be entrepreneurs, who choose to be, to imp- that that's the path they choose to walk, that they don't get recognized for what they do mm. for the community. Mm. Like, uh, it's the like for example like a lot when I would like you said right like don't get me wrong the social worker is helping people but and we need them and we, we need them yes. but if I'm successful I can do much more mm-hmm. you know what I mean I can I can have the resources to do bigger things to have a bigger impact mm-hmm. right and a lot of people don't realize that they think we're just the ugly developer just here to like take everything and miss big money mm-hmm. you know what I mean um, they forget that the biggest people who contribute to charity are the richest people in the world. You know, they, they are the ones who they pay the most taxes, they do the most charity, and some of them, nobody likes them either. It's true. <laughs> and, and what I know that sometimes they, because they want to, maybe in other areas of their life, they don't feel valued, they don't feel they're getting, uh, they don't feel special, they don't feel important. So sometimes people use religion or sometimes people use I'm a social worker. It's almost as a way. I won't. I don't want to say as an excuse, but as a way for them to feel special. Oh, you know what? But they are special. I just think there needs to be uh, better recognition mm-hmm. uh, of uh, maybe you know of entrepreneurs, right? Like people that drive the economy, create jobs, and all that. You know, they give a lot back to the to to the society. And when I feel that we're always underappreciated. Mm-hmm. Entrepreneur, yes. Okay. Mm. So why don't we take some questions from the audience and see how we do? Uh, okay. Now, who has a question? Put up your hand, and then we'll grab. A, we'll run a mic to you, David. You got the mic. Check. 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 Perfect. Good. good. Okay, your hand up. Okay, put your hand. Maybe yeah there. Tyler, maybe stand up so people can hear you as well. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, So I'm just curious what your experience has been working with the Trump family 
And if there's any specific quality that you respect or admire in, in any of them, what would that be? Uh, the experience has been great, actually. Like I said, um, negotiate, they're very tough negotiators. They're very savvy business people. Um, and, but yeah, once, you, you, you know, once they're on your side, they are 100% on your side. So it's been a great experience for, for me and my team because um, when my team interacts with their, their side, they kind of step their game up as well, right? Because it's like, oh, these guys are really efficient. These guys are really smart. We've got we to gotta, we gotta look good in front of them. So it's been a great experience. Um, yeah. So they kind of raise your standard as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's awesome. I think, you know, um, this, this move has been great. I mean, I never really thought about, uh, that's the other thing I would say, and I don't really think about the, the future uh, in, in, in that sense. Mm. I think people spend too much time, like, it's such a cliche, what's your five-year goal, 10-year goal, and all that, I'm like, oh man, you know, that's such a cliche. You're trying to figure out what to do this year. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think sometimes we need to just focus on the present, mm. and the present's gonna, the future becomes the present, you know what I mean? So if the present is awesome, the future's gonna be awesome, you know? Be, um, that's how I feel, like, now that I've, uh, this project is on its way to, to become everything I thought it would be, um, it's already opened so many doors for me, and there's so many more opportunities for me now. Um, so I don't worry about the future. I just focus on uh, executing on the present and making sure it's just awesome. Does that answer your question, Tyler? Yes. Round of applause for Tyler. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> David? Yeah, okay. That's fine. And just say your name so, so we can hear you. So, hi, my name is... No, do the mic. Do the mic? Yeah, the video needs the mic. <laughs> Here you go. I'm afraid a little bit too loud. Okay, hi. hi. And your name is? I'm Kelvin Koo. Kelvin, I'm everybody say hi, Kevin. <laughs> hi, guys. First, I'd like to thank you for that talk. It's so interesting knowing your story. I am personally actually from Malaysia as well, and I moved to Vancouver and have the opportunity to be part of Young Entrepreneur Society International as the VP of Vancouver Operations. But before that, I want to ask you two fun questions. Are you ready for that? Okay. All right, cool. I'm scared now. So first <laughs> question i like to ask you is if you had three superpowers, what would they be? And... <laughs> And the last question, if there's one thing you miss about Malaysia, thing, I meant food, what is that? What is that flavor of food? Okay, three superpowers. I guess this is um, which, which, which X-Men, right? I would, I would actually like to read people's minds. I would like to uh, read people's minds. That's one thing. Powers that it will help you be su more successful. Yeah, not flying because I'm afraid of heights. So um, two more. Um, if I could heal people, that would be, that'd be good. Um, yeah. Third one. Oh man, this is, I, I can't think of the third one. <laughs> yeah, what's the, the other question? Mal Malaysian food. Malaysian food? So what is your favorite Malaysian food? I would say Naslama. Score. Yeah. Awesome. Too. One of applause for Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then we'll come back to the front. Hello. And your I'm name Alok. is? Can you hear it? Yeah, what's your name? Alok. Alok? Hi, Alok. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let try that again. Hi, Alok. Hi. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your authenticity. The question is, if you are building an organization in Vancouver within the limits of the local cu culture and uh, rules and regulations, how do you build an organizational culture that is halfway Asian and halfway Western, following mm. up on your uh, earlier comments? Good question. I think the, the world is becoming half, Asi half Asian and half Western. <laughs> so <laughs> you need to be able to, and Vancouver is a good representation of that. Um, I think you need to be able to understand both sides, um, both cultures, and I guess learn how to manage both cultures and so that you know, you can get everyone to support you and be effective at work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll pause. Thanks, David. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Desmond Soon. I'm also a hold on, hold on. What's the name? Malaysian. What's Desmond. Your name? Desmond. Hi, Desmond. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm a Singaporean Malaysian as well, so coincidental. And so my question for you, uh, Jukim, is can you tell us about what was the hardest struggle that you had in your darkest time throughout this project <laughs> when you thought things were going to fall apart? And what did you do to hold yourself together or what did you do to push through? I think in, uh, when I first came in 2009, it was very bleak. Everyone here is having a great time now, but in 2009, people forget it was a bleak, bleak time and we were also very worried. Um, so just to give you some context, when I came back to take over the company, I had probably four people resign the first day I showed up. Um, and then I had I found out I had like six legal suits on my table, six people were suing us. So I was like, hmm, okay. And then, you know, stuff just like, there was a, not a lot of continuity. Like we don't know like the history of so many things. So stuff can't sort of stuff would just come and bite us from out of nowhere. And we had no clue where it came from, right? So a lot of problems would, co would, would come and I, there's no s specific um, problem that I thought was insurmountable, but you know, obviously they were darkest, um, mo dark moments when, um, you know, I, I, you know, it was tough, you know, where, you know, you felt that I don't know what I can do this, right? And for me, and this is where I share my faith because I'm a Christian. Um, so, you know, I just, I just give it all to God. You know, I just tell him that, you know, all this is, 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 is yours and I'm just doing my best for you. And, um, you know, you, Come save me, <laughs> basically. Come save me, you know, because uh, and uh, and I cry out to God, you know, and actually we we pray in the office um, every morning. Um, sometimes I, I I miss it. I must admit, you know, but um, that's what I do. Yeah. Let's take a question from David. Where's David? David. Okay. Okay. Perfect, sir. Um. Hi. My name's Kyla. Oh. Uh, what's your name? My name's Kyla. Hi, Kyla. <laughs> um, I was wondering, what's your advice to young people like myself that want to be successful, want to own big corporations, hotels, all that stuff, but don't even know how, like how to start or what to do? Like, because it's also overwhelming. Mm. As a young person, uh, how young first? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't even know. Uh, just graduating high school. Oh, just graduating. Oh, okay, well, you're a baby. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I think, um, like I said, you need to, from young to develop the right winning habits. Um, so I think it's important as a young person to have, uh, to have achievements even from a young age. I think it's, like I said, I think excellence starts when you're young and it's carried out throughout your life. Um, you look back to most people, if they've been winners all their life, because you see, what I'm trying to say is, there are going to be moments in your life when you are going to question yourself and you're going to doubt yourself. And what you need, what helps is when you look back on yourself and then you say, you know what, I've always been a winner. When I did this, when I was, uh, was in sports, I was the best. When I was in school, I was the best. You know, I did all these things and I was successful. So. Maybe this is a stumbling block, but you know what? I have always been successful. I've always somehow had the, what it takes to be successful. So I think that's important. So I'm thinking of as a young person, it's good to build that confidence and build that, uh, not that resume or, or the, that the experience that you have that you can lean back on yourself and s not just to impress other people, but so that when you are questioning yourself, you will know that I've got what it takes to be successful. I've always been successful. So it doesn't necessarily mean um, a specific area. I think just basically anything that you do or that you have a passion that you participate in, do it to your fullest capability. Give 100% to everything that you do and make sure it's the best. And that's building excellence. So, you know, like I said, you know, that's going to translate to anything that you do because you see, 
I always feel that, you know, it's a process to become great. It's a process to become successful. You need to have, um, it's like a little, little successes that you need to have that's going to lead to a big success. And a lot of big success is going to eventually make you great, you know. So everything that you do, you must always think, you know, it's going to be the best. It's going to be successful. It's going to be the best and it's going to be successful. And so you, you, that's the type of mentality you must have in everything that you do. So next time when you get a job or um, you do anything, you have the same mentality that I'm just going to dominate, I'm going to be the best, all right? Everyone here, please understand, you know, like, and, and then you have that, you have that, I wouldn't say killer mentality, you have that winner men mentality that that's going to bring you uh, to, to the level that you want to get. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Michael. Hi, Hi. Michael. Um, so a lot of people in general that I found out is they have a trouble with focus and uh, staying with the hustle and doing whatever it takes to get to success. So I just wanted to ask, so what are some strategies you'd recommend us uh, on staying focused and staying in the hustle? I think it's very hard, it much harder now with, uh, with the internet and cell phones <laughs> and all that. Because I'm older, right? Uh, when I, I wasn't so distracted, He's you know. He's not that old. <laughs> like kids these days, I guess they want everything instantaneous, and it's so hard to stay focused. I'm glad I'm not in school now, right? Because I would have no chance of paying attention in class now. Um, that's a that's a tough question. Um, I think you know. For me, it's very easy to be focused. I, I don't know, maybe it's a guy thing. I cannot multitask. Um, I only can do one thing at a time. You know, so uh, it's, easy, it's easy for me to focus. Like, I'm the kind of person where um, when I do something, it's 100% there. I'm like, right now, I'm 100% here. Nothing else is on my mind. Um, and I think that's, that's how I can be effective. Um, how do you be focused? I know it comes to me naturally. I think maybe just understanding that you have to master something. And the only way you're going to master something is you focus. Um, doing that thing and make sure you, you know, you're just freaking good in it. Let's, let's bring the mic to the front. Oh, hi. Okay. One last question then. Okay. My name is Sunil Reki. Uh, hi, Sunil. Hi. 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 Uh, I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm involved with uh, hotels. Have you been to my presentation center? Uh, yeah, I am actually. Uh, yeah? So I, uh, uh, me and my partner, we're involved with hotels, development, um, and a lot of uh, land assemblies here in Vancouver. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you. You know, your speech, like, was very humble. And I thank you for sharing your, uh, I think you got a brilliant mind. You know, and my partner was, we were just commenting on that. I think he, he deserves a, a round of applause for his brilliance. Thank you. And you'll speak closer to the mic. So uh, the one question that I got is, um, you know, the, what is the most proudest and the most successful project that you have done in your business career that you can kind of almost, you know, brag a little bit about? I'd love to. I like. I like to share that. Well, it's definitely Trump. 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 Is Trump number definitely one, eh? is. It's my. It's my. It's my big coming out party. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Round of <laughs> And the last. The last thing is. Um, I know you're very humble. Um, I'd like to share share a dream which me and my uh, business partner uh, actually have in our mind. Uh, the kind of business motive and uh, the humbleness is what we have is. All the people on Hastings um, and all, all the poor people or the unfortunate people, I shouldn't say poor, but unfortunate people, we'd like to uh, actually incorporate our dream with you, which is one is having a building, a building where we can recycle and kind of bring people off the street, come into a, a building where they will have beds and come into a building where they will uh, basically have lawyers, have counselors, have social workers, you know, kind of regenerate these people off and back into the world, you know. Uh, maybe when you do have time, 
you know? And uh, like you said, no stone is unturned because you are an entrepreneur. Sit down with us and maybe become part of our dream, you know? Whenever you got time. Anyways, we should meet. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much. Round of applause. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Father. Hi, guys. My name is Reen. Reen. Uh, Reen. 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 Yeah. Hi, Reen. Um, I saw in another interview where you talked about how you really value the concept of leaving a legacy, and you know, throughout tonight, you you felt really genuine, and you talked about wanting to give back to the world. So I'm really curious about how um, how you envision what you want your legacy to be like. Mm. Okay. Um, good question. Good question. Um, you see, in uh, this this is always. Um, quite relevant here in, um, in Vancouver because people here always expect, um, I guess, people who are successful to to give back to the community. Um, certainly, that's the case. Um, I feel though that um, there is a time and place for that. I think if you look in um, most people, like they give. The, the, the charity work or community work that they do usually happens later in their career. The Warren Buffett, the yeah, be because they've already made it, you know, and because you see, like, there is only so much time you have in a day, right? And I believe when you're young, when you're starting to grow your company and you can work hard, your focus should not be doing charity work. That's not my job. My job is to be an entrepreneur and to grow my company, make sure my country is successful. So I'm very focused on that. So later in life, when I'm successful um, and I have more time, then all these things can definitely take a, a, a bigger part in my in my life. Um, so, but having said that, you know, we also still contribute, right? We like, you know, we. We, we give jobs to people. Um, we, you know, hopefully, we, we help them get to where they want to get. Yeah, in one way or another, whether it's financially, like maybe through this talk somehow, maybe I've helped someone, um, you know, get to where they want to get. So, that's that's I guess um, my legacy. I guess I don't. What's a good question? I'm I'm a young guy. I haven't even thinking about my legacy yet. Um, that that is a question maybe you should ask me maybe when I'm slightly older. I think right now I just want to I just want to be successful, and um, I hope that I I'll be known as a person who you know of a high integrity and that I have gone about it the right way and I'm you know I've helped people on the way as well. That's 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 I guess that's what I feel right now. Thank you. Okay. Let's take. How about two last questions? One from here. Oh, no, Ali, okay. Hi, my name is Ali. Hi, Ali. Uh, try that. Hi, Ali. Hi. My first question is, uh, would you accept the 38 years old guy as an adoption? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sorry, I just joke. Uh, uh, <laughs> I know, you know, uh, all of us, when we make decisions, we do our best based on the current knowledge that we have. Right. As you said, you know, you, you're going through to do the best for this, you know, projects. But based on the current knowledge, if you go back to the beginning of this project, what would you, what's the top two things you would have done different? What's the two things you would have changed? I would have done everything faster. That's it. Uh, I don't think I made any mistakes. Uh, the only things that uh, I didn't make any fatal mistakes. You know, I did small mistakes here and there that could be uh, fixed. Um, I think I took too long to make decisions, um, and because I guess I underestimated the task. It's just so <laughs> many things to do. To do right. So um, looking back. Um, I just, yeah, I, I hope I, in the future, I would make decisions quicker and go faster. Um, well, this is my first big project. I got to be a little bit more careful. Um, but as a principal still, you know, we leave no stone unturned, right? I mean, I don't make a decision until I have a total peace about it. 
And then once you, you know, once you make the decision, it's done. There's no turning back. Let's say you're, ne- you're, now, all, you're now 60 years old, something like that. Yeah. Now you've got a kid, a daughter. If you were to leave your son one piece of advice, what would, what would that be? Is that good? Yeah. Oh, man, if that's the case, uh, then it's not really business. It would be, I would just tell my son, whatever you do, um, stay close to God. And, and say the question again. Just um, my question is, do you think you've been able to do what you've done today about Western family finances? And if so, how? Probably not, to be honest. Um, you know, but I, I, with all due respect, I think that question is redundant because I don't live in a world of uh, what ifs. You know, I don't think about things that could have been or should have been. I think it's a waste of time. You know, um, so because if, like one of the things about I could share is growing up as a second generation guy, um, a lot of people don't get it unless you're a second generation guy. Um, from a young age, people almost despise you from the day you're born, and they they they're jealous of you, and they they think that um, you know you're just born with a silver spoon, you know, and uh, you're a spoiled kid. And, you know, you'll never be as good or whatever, you know. And so from, from a young age, really, you'll be like, whoa, man, this is kind of harsh. You don't even know me, right? Um, so I struggled with that when I was younger, um, people judging me um, when they didn't know me. And also because my parents were so successful, it is overwhelming. And to think that I could ever be as good as them, right? And so... Um, but it comes to a point of time where I just go, I don't care, you know? I don't care what the people think about me. I know who I am. And I'm not interested to be like my father. I'm interested to build my own, you know, my own legacy, to build my own identity. So um, I think that's important. Um, and you cannot be a clone of someone else. None of us here can be like anyone else. If you're trying to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or that, it's not going to happen. You gotta be your own self. You gotta write your own story, right? So um, that's what I've. I re- that's one of the things I realized in life that I have to be comfortable with who I am. I cannot change the fact that I was born a second generation guy. I can't change that. I have, to, I have to accept it, and I should use it as a benefit. Like if my dad has so much knowledge and resources, I should tap on that, you know, and make full use about it. Uh, Use, use of it and try to do even better. My goal is still to be better than my father and uh, hopefully I got some, some years ahead, right, to, to, to do that. So, um, but at the same time, you know, I'm a lot like my father, but I'm not as well. Like me and my father, we clashed. You know, we still do. I mean, because I'm not him, you know, and uh, I have different ideals, you know, and I'm not saying he's right or I'm right or who's wrong. It's just, um, this is how it is, right? You have to be your own um, person. David? David, can you, can you, can you bring me the, uh, the award, please? Yeah, Jen, thank you, Jen. How many found value from tonight's evening? Yes? Yes, okay. Thank you. Now, and on behalf of Roger, Roger, are you, Roger, come up. Please come up, Roger. Round of applause for Roger Kellen, my co-organizer for this event. Please. Oh, come on. You can t- louder. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So on, on behalf of Vancouver Business Network and also Vancouver Entrepreneurs Group, we have an award, Entrepreneur of the, fifth, Entrepreneur of the Year of the 15th Award for Ju Kim Tia, Ho Wan Group. Oh, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Wow, wow. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, heavy. Heavy. Let's <laughs> you give me in the middle. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry.